This is the Bring Back Soul Music Podcast, the only podcast devoted to making soul music relevant again. Let's get started with your host, Todd Woodson. for joining me for another episode of the Bring Back Soul Music Podcast. My special, special, special guest today is a Grammy Award-winning writer and singer. His name is Alvin Garrett. Mr. Garrett, how are you doing today, sir? I'm doing wonderful. How are you? How are you? I'm good, man. Welcome to the Bring Back Soul Music Podcast. Listen, I'm, I'm so excited to be a part of bringing back the soul. So thank There you, you go. See, I like that enthusiasm. Thank you, sir. Oh, yeah. People yeah. like you who are going to make, make a comeback. Yes, yes, we have to, man. You got to have soul if you're going to bring back the soul, right? <laughs> there you go. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So uh, you got a new album out yes, called The yeah. uh, the Lightness of Love, which I love, by the way. We're going to get into that. Mm -hmm. uh, but for those who don't know Alvin Garrett, tell us about Alvin Garrett. Well, man, I, I am a Alabama born and raised preacher's kid. So, you know, I'm a Southern boy. I like to call myself a Southern gentleman. Um, I've, I've been to L out in California where you are. I've been a lot of places and there's just something about being from the South. And, you know, I love people from everywhere else. I love going other places, but we kind of got a little different. We're a little different down here, right? <laughs> and I love it. Uh, and I try to capture that in my music, uh, that, that richness, that soul uh, from the South, uh, that, that gentleman-like uh, uh, chivalry. I try to capture that in my music. And um, I started out in church, man, preacher's kid, um, uh, playing bass guitar in church, you know, went went to college, played football, uh, went from there, studied business, and just got into music, you know, for business, for my life. And I wanted music to be how I raised my family and how I lived my life. And so after 20 years um, of growing from being a musician to a producer, to a songwriter, you know, of course, being a business owner. Here I am today, uh, finally, an artist, which was an aspiration that actually uh, grew in the latter part of my uh, development in the music industry. Uh, so I didn't start off singing, wasn't a front man at first. I was more behind the scenes um, and, and writing and producing. But here I am, I found my own voice, found my own style, found my own inspirational soul. And so I'm, I'm excited about where I am in my career now. Yeah, man, I uh, I got uh, a hold of some of your music, man, and uh, we're gonna talk about your style a little bit later, man, because it's a uh, it's a rich it's a richness to you that is reminiscent of those great singers from the past. Mm -hmm. uh, but we're, we're we're gonna get to that in just a little bit. I want to delve a little bit more into your um, your upbringing, so to speak. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, you said you're from Tuscaloosa, Alabama, uh, yeah. area that I know pretty well. My dad used to live in Alabama. Um, but you said you grew up as a preacher's kid. Um, did you ever um, do gospel music? You know, I um, I grew up in what we call quartet gospel, right? And you actually, when we talk about my style, you hear a lot of that influence of quartet music, you know, just real cool, catchy melodies, real simple bass lines, stuff that make you move nice and repetitive um, melodies. That's very um, influential in my music. Um, but I didn't grow up in a religious uh, household. My dad was not a, shall I say, religious preacher. Well, God's going to get you right. <laughs> it was more of a spiritual uh, love and hope and, and faith. And that's what he taught me. Uh, um, that's the principles of of church of God, more so than this religious thing that I think uh, makes people so rigid, in my opinion. Uh, so I, I, I was not restricted from listening to good quality music. I listened to jazz. I listened to some good soulful R&B. So I was exposed to a, a broad array of music as long as it was clean. You know what I'm saying? As long as right. it was wholesome. 
you know, and that's, and, and I realized that has influenced me as a writer, uh, but I've never been a gospel artist. I've written gospel, still write gospel. Matter of fact, had the number one billboard song coming into 2021, a song called Patiently Praising uh, by Lowell Pye is a song that I wrote. So I've had a lot of uh, chart topping songs as a gospel songwriter, but not as an, an artist. Because, you know, for me personally, I, I want to make music uh, for people to listen if they don't want to go to church, right? <laughs> um, but still be inspired. Correct. Right. All mm-hmm. right. Do you um, do you have siblings who are in the music business too, or just or do you have siblings at all? Let me just ask that. I do have siblings. I have uh, two brothers and a sister, and my uh, you know my brothers tried to rap a little bit, but, <laughs> but never did really get into it professionally. Um, uh, I, for some reason, I just kind of took it and ran with it, you know, but everybody else kind of had a little bit of talent, messed around in church, but didn't make a life out of it, you know. Okay. Um, did your uh, did your parents give you any kind of advice before you uh, sought off to get into uh, into the music business? Uh, man, absolutely. My entire life was built around parental advice. <laughs> <laughs> Funny enough, I spent so much time, I spent more time with my parents talking than I did even with my siblings. And for some strange reason, I found more camaraderie with my parents, you know, and everything I learned about business, my mom taught me, she came from more of an agricultural background, sharecropping, and taught me about how, you know, how to invest, but with the principles of farming, you Mm -hmm. know, and my dad, coal miner, uh, you know, hardworking man, taught me the principles of hard work and ethics, you know what I'm saying? And, And how, you know, integrity, so it was the lessons and, and conversations that I had with them growing up about what faith is all about. And, and when I got older and decided to make some strategic business moves for my career, I was able to lean on those teachings and that advice um, on, on how to do my business. Of course, going to college, getting a business degree helped me add to that fundamental core that my parents put in me. Uh, so it was a blend of, of always having um, I say strong, encouraging parents that I had a good enough relationship with to talk to to growing up. And uh, even at those biggest moments in my life where I was leaving corporate America, you know, it's like, hey, you remember what y'all taught me? You told me to take that leap, you know? So um, I've always uh, tried to make my parents proud. Okay. Where did you uh, you go to college? Uh, Sanford University in Birmingham, Alabama, which is where I live now. So I moved from Tuscaloosa to Birmingham to go to college, and I've been here ever since. Okay, so you didn't stray too far from, too far from home. Oh yeah, it's just a quick forty-five minutes. I'm home, you know, back here uh, in Birmingham, which is which I've been here since 1996. Okay, how did you, um, how did you uh, get your start? How did you? What was kind of like the the turning point, or how did you get to where you are today? Well, I'll say it, it's been a progression, you know, uh, just from that decision. Honestly, when I came to college, I decided that I didn't want to learn. I, I didn't want to study music. I wanted to learn business because I knew that, OK, I was just one of those natural players with bass, you know, bad boy. I played by ear, could play anything I heard. I knew I was like, how much better can I get <laughs> to make than to make a living? So I just knew that. I wanted, if I was going to make a living doing music, I needed to understand business. And so I chose to study business management. And I will be honest, man, that was the most important decision for me that has kept me competitive um, in this ever-changing music industry, because I understand it from a side of a point of uh, view that most musicians, singers, writers don't, and they get uh, sort of taken <laughs> in this business because they don't understand it, don't understand the language. Uh, so I'll say that was not one singular thing that got me started. It was a choice that said, let me go on this path. And then all of my decisions and experiences have lined up with that choice. Okay. Um, well, that's, do you find that, um, uh... Do you find that most artists are sort of now in tune to the business side of music versus just the the singing side of it? You know what I mean? Like, 
you used to hear like these horror stories back in the day about, you know, people signing bad contracts and stuff like that. Um, do you find that that's changed a lot since maybe more exposure or the internet, so to speak? No, I don't. No. <laughs> I think um, the lack of understanding when it comes to business is still as prevalent as it always been. So for instance, I'll say when people say 360 deal, oh man, and they hear it. They're like, oh no, they're gonna take everything. I'm like, not really. You know, do you understand what it really is? Do you understand why it's necessary? Why would an, a company give you this huge advance and they can't recoup it from, from sales anymore? You know, the manufacturing industry died. So it was a necessity to justify the investment in your career to put the money behind you to promote. So a 360 deal, if it increases the value of your intellectual property may not be a bad deal, <laughs> but it's just the scariness of it because you don't understand how the inner workings of a 360 deal, most artists run from it and they say, well, I don't stay independent. Well, you own hundred percent of nothing, you know? <laughs> so, so it's the same, uh, shall I say, situation in terms of people not really diving in and understanding business, period, not just the music business, but just business, period. Um, and, and I see that same, that same thing. It just leads to a different type of horror story, right? All right. So you're, you're a proponent of the, uh, the 360 deal? I'm not saying I'm a proponent of it. I'm a proponent of reading and understanding and making the decision that's best for you, um, but not uh, listening just to other people's experiences and say, oh no, stay away from that, but it may be the best thing for you. So I'm a proponent of educating yourself and really thinking things through, putting a good team together if you can, because people say, get a good team. But it's a lot harder to get a team than it you know, sounds, you know, but if you can get um, good advisors or reach out to people that can give you information, you know, it's, it's advisable to do so. Uh, so I'm not against the 360 deal. Uh, for me personally, I've built a career where I can invest in myself because I know that the type of music that I make, most labels don't want to put resources behind an artist like me because I'm not, you know, I've chosen not to go down that, you know, that path of just, you know, just sex, 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 party, party, party. And that's where a lot of the modern day R&B singers have gone because that's where the labels are pushing them. So I understand my brand may not be appealing, so I have to do it a different way. Okay. Um, let me, uh, let me back, backtrack just a little bit, Alvin. Um, you said earlier that you, you started off writing and playing in the background. Were you, um, were you, were you apprehensive before, um, stepping out front? Um, was it ever your intention to step out front and just happenstance that you started singing or um, how did that, cause I, I look at your bio and I see that you, you've written for Joe and Kelly Rowland and Fantasia and Johnny Gill, you know, some heavy hitters. Um, yeah. So, but was it your plan to put your foot in the door as a writer or producer and then sing or how did that come about? Or it's just, Circumstance, the right place no, at the right time. I, I had no intention whatsoever being a front. None. <laughs> I literally, I saw myself writing for artists like that, and that was it. For my dad, you know, who I truly value, um, as you can probably tell from my earlier <laughs> answers to your question, my parents, he said, son, why are you giving all your songs away? He said, listen to yourself. He's like, nobody can sing your songs like you. Because I would always send them the demos, but then he'd hear the release version of the artist. He's like, I know, he said, they just don't sing it like you. It don't feel, it don't feel the same. Right? And so I, I, was, I wasn't listening to myself as an artist. I was listening to myself, you know, like what would Joe sound like singing it, right? So I said, let me trust. And I went back and I started listening. And I'm like, wow, okay. And I just trusted him. He said, give it a shot. Just why don't you put out some of your own songs? And also it was the pressure of, you know, being rejected all the time as well, because before I got to all those placements you mentioned, I was <laughs> told no by a lot of people as well. And so I kind of started feeling like maybe I am going to have to sing my own music to get it heard. 
So I was sort of, it was sort of a, a collision of both of those experiences of what if nobody sings your songs and dad saying, you should sing your songs. And eventually I decided to step out around 2012 with my first project, Expose Yourself. And uh, it, it was a great experience and I was hella nervous, hella nervous because I was comparing myself to all of the great artists that I had been around and I didn't quite hear myself as an artist at that point. I only heard myself as the demo guy. And so it, it, it took a minute, took several years for me to grow into mm. hearing Alvin Garrett's voice and not Alvin the writer's voice. Okay. Well, uh, kudos to your dad for uh, convincing you to step out there. Yeah. Um, like I said, you have such a, uh, a unique, um, maybe not so unique, but at least for this time, I think is somewhat unique. Um, mm -hmm. Like I said earlier that you're kind of reminiscent of some of the artists from the past. When I listen to some of your songs, I hear some of Otis Redding, I hear some Sam oh, yeah. Cooke, I hear some Al Green. Mm -hmm. um, and those are, you know, classic uh, R&B artists. Um, but we're going to pause right here, uh, Alvin, and we're going to play your, um, your latest video, uh, the title track to your new album, The Lightness of Love. This is Alvin Garrett, The Lightness of Love. Enjoy. We'll continue our episode after this message. Are you looking for a reliable way to transfer money to family and friends? Check out the Cash App. It's safe, easy, and convenient. Just download the app from the Apple or Google Play Store and start receiving and sending money in a few minutes. Sign up today and receive $5. And don't forget to use our referral code. VGRC. WQX. Swag at shop.bringbacksoulmusic.com. Now, back to our conversation. All right, album. Uh, man, that is a, a great song. Let me ask you real quick, though. Um, this album, how long did this album take to, uh, from start to finish? How long did it take to put together? And interesting enough, this, the lightness of love was the fastest album I've ever recorded. <laughs> I actually uh, recorded two songs in November, uh, a song called Go Together and My Gift to You. And then the week between Christmas and New Year's, I recorded the rest of them. Boom, 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 boom. But I wrote them, they just came to me and I was just in a place where the music was flowing and my voice was just there and I just stayed in the studio and each day I just recorded a song, boom, boom, and then just mixed them all and had them ready uh, to go at the top of the year. And uh, honestly, I've never recorded that quickly. Mm -hmm. And I'm pretty, I'm pretty savvy in the studio, but in terms of uh, how everything flowed out, and I think it was a culmination of me finding myself. We talked about in the earlier segment about me hearing my voice. I think during the pandemic, I was able to finally hear myself and find my artistry and find my voice, you know, my register in my voice. I dropped my register a little bit because in some of my previous albums, I was singing in a higher register and all of my songs kind of up a little higher. But this project, I kind of relaxed my voice a little bit because I relaxed, <laughs> you know. Uh, I let go a lot of the uh, burdens I used to carry as an artist to impress people. Um, I stopped comparing myself to other artists because, hey, we could all be dead in the <laughs> so, <laughs> so I had a different perspective. Like, let me just sing for freedom. Let me sing to hear myself sing, to find that space. And that's what I found um, in 2020 uh, that was one of the positive um, outcomes. Of course, it's hard to talk about positive outcomes when we went through so much. But for me, I found myself. I found my artistry. Is that um, is that hard to do? Um, because I guess maybe being um, a person that people aren't so familiar with, I know not just in music but anything else. People want to label you and mm -hmm. put you in a certain box or a certain category. And like you said, you had to find your voice. Is it is that hard to do? Um, did you um, do you feel any? I guess, do you feel any pressure from the outside to conform to someone else's idea of what you are, who you should be? 
You know, I've always been sort of, a, uh, I'll say a loner. Um, I put pressure on myself to try to sell something, right? So I would take uh, the audience's uh, perception into account. And then I said, let me create something that I think they would want. So that would guide, you know, a lot of the music I was making in the earlier portion of my career, because I'm thinking, what are they going to think? What are they going to think? Well, I let that go. And I'm like, I don't really care. <laughs> uh, I'll be, I love it. And that's, and I feel like that is that next level for artistry because an artist doesn't really care what anybody thinks about their art. You know, um, now I'm not saying that I don't consider my audience. I'm not saying that. I'm saying that if I can't listen to my music every day and love it, why would I expect my audience to? So I made, I took a different approach instead of trying to just sell myself and listen to what everybody's thinking. So let me find the people that love this music as much as I do, and I'll cater to them, right? But let me start here. Let me start with my own uh, connection with my music and then embrace those that embrace me as opposed to trying to force myself on people. And that changed my marketing strategy. It changed everything about how I went about the business uh, because I may have been overlooking uh, certain fans because I was trying to target certain, a different type of demographic, you know, and I found that with this music I'm making now, man, I have older white ladies and older white guys who say, man, that sounds like the music I grew up on. Well, that's, you don't wake up thinking, okay, well, I'm a 60 year old white woman is going to be my <laughs> biggest fan, but that's what I'm experiencing. So I said, let me make sure I market myself in a way that they can embrace me and my artistry as opposed to me just trying to pick my fans. Let the music draw them to me. Okay. Um, getting back to the lightness of love. Did you, uh, did you write all the songs on that, on that album or? Yes. Yes. Um, all of my albums, the only song in my entire artist artistic catalog that I haven't written was a cover of Be Thankful for What You Got by William Devon mm. on my album in 2019, uh, This Hill. I did a, a remake of, you know, what they call Diamond in the Back, you know, because <laughs> I it was just one of my favorite songs. But that's the only song I've ever written that I, I mean, ever recorded that I haven't written. Okay. And so you produce all your own music as well, or do you work with different producers or? I work with different music producers, uh, depending on the sound that I want and that I'm going for. And I, I've done a lot of music production, but I found that through collaboration on the music side, I've been able to kind of move forward a little differently. Um, just, I love music. And, and my, my next album, In My Mind, I'm going to actually produce the music because I haven't done that in a very long time where I actually produce and arrange all of the music. So that's what I'm looking forward to uh, in 2022. Uh, but up to this point, I've had a great team of uh, producers and musicians that could, you know, help me get my sound um, that way I want it. Okay. Um, yeah, speaking of 2022, let's go back a little bit. Um, when was your first, um, first album? What was the title of that album? Expose Yourself, and it was 2012. Okay. Uh, when my first project came out. And then uh, moved forward 2015, I released a single called By Myself. And I believe that that song was when I sort of made the transition um, that got me on the path today in terms of that soulful sound, that rich sound that you say you heard and you feel. That's when that happened. And Expose Yourself was more contemporary R&B. Beautiful project, beautiful project. Um, but that was more of the contemporary R&B style. Okay. Um, okay. So lightness of love. And I know we touched on it briefly about this pandemic everyone is going through. Mm -hmm. um, summer is almost over, coming to a, a close, I guess. Um, are there any specific plans to tour or get out there and showcase this great music? Um, what's the plan going forward? Well, man, we've been uh, moving around, started doing some shows. I actually just performed uh, this morning uh, at, a, at a school for all the teachers and staff uh, coming back into the school system and just encouraging them. So that was a, a great opportunity. I've done some outside festivals here in Alabama. Haven't toured outside of the state just yet, uh, but I've done a lot of live stream shows. 
Uh, and so if people go to my YouTube page, they can check out some clips from my live uh, stream uh, performances that I've done. And so with my live stream, you know, like I say, I, I get the band, the lights, the jumbo screen, and just make it an enjoyable experience um, and not just something you throw out there for your fans. So my plan uh, is to, you know, of course, be safe for myself and my family and my community. Uh, but as things open up, hope to start traveling, um, but continue to do things like this and let people know who I am. My music has traveled overseas during this pandemic. Got a lot of uh, fans building in the UK, a lot of uh, traction over there. So we're all just waiting for things to change and hoping uh, that we can get on the road uh, more aggressively here in the near future. Okay. Um, yeah, that'd be ideal. Um, so when you're planning that tour, make sure you hit Southern California too, man. Yeah, so absolutely, absolutely, <laughs> absolutely. absolutely. You know? hey, let me ask you. Um, uh, I I love your music. I think it's I think it's great. Uh, it's so different than what's not knocking what's out now, but it's so different than what we're now accustomed to listening to. Mm -hmm. What do you hope uh, people get out of your music? Well, I'll, I'll say inspiration is always at the core of my music. Um, I try to tie in and I think about the person listening to my music. What, what do I want them to feel? And I want the music to inspire people, be it inspire you to love, be it inspire you to be grateful, inspire you to dream, um, inspire you to look at that woman <laughs> as a treasure, as a queen and not an object, you know, just to inspire people to think and feel. So I like to write uh, intelligently, but still simple enough where a child can understand and feel. And I actually test my music with my daughters, you know, because I want to make music that my 11 year old and my seven year old can sing back uh, without me saying, oh, hey, don't say that, you know, because how else can my music travel from generation to generation if I have to turn it off to protect the ears of my children, right? And I think that's what we're missing in R&B and music. Let's say modern day R&B music. You have to, if you care about your children and what's appropriate, you have to turn it off. But you didn't have to turn off the music of the, those gentlemen that you mentioned and compared me to, which I'm honored, you didn't have to turn off Otis Redding when the kids are around, right. and Al Green and Sam Cooke, you don't turn them off, you turn them up. And so uh, you and, and I, we appreciate the music of our, uh, our parents and our grandparents because it was wholesome. And I think we've gotten so far away from that. And that I have my theories for another show why that has happened, but I have chosen, I have chosen to be that pioneer that says, I'm going to do it again. I'll do it if I have to do it with a small group of, of team members that believe in me. We're going to push this music. And it may it may be uh, past my lifetime that it matters, right? But it's still worth it. Um, because Sam Cooke didn't know he was going to influence me. <laughs> you know what I mean? Right. But I'm here influenced by his music. Uh, so I, I just, I take that pride to say, hey, let me make music that is wholesome, that is inspiring, that you can play for any uh, race, any back, you know, any gender, any sexuality, it's just good music. And um, that means a lot to me to stand behind that, that principle. All right, Alvin, um, Lightness of Love, like I said, great album. Um, I, I hope people pick it up. Anything else that's coming about that you wanna make us aware of? Absolutely, man. Well, The Lightness of Love has become uh, sort of, it's a great album, as you mentioned, but it's also becoming a movement. So I decided, let me just stick with it for a while. So I'm releasing a deluxe version of The Lightness of Love uh, coming out September 3rd. And I just released uh, a new single from that project, a song called Flowers, which is now available. So you can get The Lightness of Love project that I released early this year but the updated deluxe version is coming out with four new amazing songs on September 3rd. So I'm really, really excited about it. And it's sticking with that same sound and that same flow of the project that you just mentioned uh, that you love so much. Yeah. Okay, so you're adding four new songs to the already existing. Yes. Ah, okay. Okay, why did you choose to do that versus say doing a, another EP or... 
Because I, I still feel like there's a lot of life left in this album. You know, okay. I'm still promoting. Uh, I, I, I want a tour with this album. I love performing these songs live. And until I get out and, and, and live this music the way I want to live it, I'm going to stick with it. Uh, because it's still fresh to a lot of people because they're just discovering it, like yeah. you say. So a lot of I think a lot of times artists give up on their music too fast. Uh, before people get a chance to discover it and, and learn it. So I'm going to stick with this project, uh, certainly through the end of this year. Um, and then, like I told you earlier, I have some ideas for my next project. Um, don't know when I'll start that, but for now, I'm spreading the light and the love, and I'm excited about the deluxe project coming out on September 3rd and the current single, Flowers, uh, which is a really, really a, a wonderful song, paying tribute uh, to people that have impacted my life and it's encouraging other people to do the same because with this pandemic you never know who could be taken in the blink of an eye so tell somebody how much they mean to you okay uh, fair enough and uh yes, that's sir. a great message to relay particularly in, in this time okay um and speaking of getting it out there uh how can people reach out to you on uh, social media uh, alvin all right. Well, you, you see my name behind me with you just put a T-H-E in front of that. And that's the Alvin Garrett on, on the uh, Facebook, on uh, Instagram and Twitter. And my website is alvingarrett.com. I love for people to connect and, and uh, get into this inspirational soul music. I agree uh, wholeheartedly, my man. Um, we'll have all of Alvin's information on our website, too, at bringbacksoulmusic.com as well as the show notes, uh, if you're watching this on YouTube. Um, Mr. Uh, Mr. Garrett, um, it's been a real pleasure, man. I appreciate yeah. you uh, taking the time today. Same here. It's been a pleasure as well. And, and thank you once again for, you know, providing opportunities for soul artists like myself to be heard and, and expanding our audience. So thank you. Yeah, and I would encourage anyone, if you want to hear some, some awesome dynamic soul music, R and B music. Pick up Alvin's new new album. And where can people pick it up? Anywhere you can yes. buy music? Yes, yes. It's streaming everywhere on all your streaming outlets. You know, we'll, the rest of the days we can't buy CDs anymore. You know, yeah, but I, re yeah. I remember the days of CDs. But you know, it's streaming anywhere for anybody to listen to right now. Um, and if you catch me at a show, I still keep. CDs on me for signing because people still like to feel the music as well. So, and we'll have a link to uh, Alvin's music on Amazon in the show notes. We don't get anything for it, but we just want you to be exposed to Mr. Garrett's music. And I think you're going to enjoy it. If you don't enjoy it, then eh, I don't know what to tell you. Something wrong with you. <laughs> Something wrong with you. It. Can't help you on that one. <laughs> Mr. Garrett, I appreciate you taking the time today, sir. Thank you, sir. All right, that's Alvin Garrett on the Bring Back Soul Music Podcast, and we'll be right back. Calling all lovers of soul music. The time to make soul music relevant again is now. You've been listening to the Bring Back Soul Music Podcast with Todd Woodson. If you enjoyed today's show, be sure to tell a friend. Make sure you never miss an episode by subscribing to our newsletter at bringbacksoulmusic.com. Well, that's our show for today. I'd like to thank my special guest, Mr. Alvin Garrett. You can find out more about Alvin on his website at alvingarrett.com. Don't forget, you can listen to the Bring Back Soul Music Podcast on iTunes, Google Podcasts, Stitcher, Spotify, and Pandora. Don't forget to subscribe to our YouTube channel at Bring Back Soul Music TV. If you have any questions or comments, please email us at comments at bringbacksoulmusic.com. I'm Todd Woodson. Thank you for joining us. See you next week.